Welcome to the East Indio Badlands Trail. My name is Colin, and I'm here with my California naturalist teammates, Elizabeth and Tracy. And we're gonna hike this almost brand new trail here in the Coachella Valley and explore the really fantastic geology that occurs right along the San Andreas Fault. So come and join us. As you're walking along the trail, the main plant that you see, and in fact, the main plant that you're gonna see almost anywhere on a trail in the Coachella Valley is called creosote bush. And this is it right here. It's got dark green foliage and it's green all year round, even in the middle of the summer and grows up to be about four, five, six feet high. There's a lot of interesting things going on with the creosote bush that we can't even get into in a 20 minute video along the trail. But there's a couple of interesting ones we can see right here. So. Even though it's fall right now, there's no flowers or buds or anything like that. You can see a few seeds on this creosote bush, and the seeds are these little uh, fuzzy white balls, and you can pick them off the bush and uh, see that they kind of fall apart into these little multi-chambered uh, seeds. Also on this bush, we're seeing really a lot of galls, spelled G-A-L-L. -L. And galls are actually a sign of an insect that is living in and around this particular creosote bush. So what's happened here is that a midge, a tiny fly, has laid its eggs inside of the branches of the creosote bush. And the eggs have caused a chemical reaction within the creosote bush that creates this mutation or growth to grow around the eggs. Then the gall provides a chamber for the midge larva to grow and hatch into an adult fly, where it can take off and then create new galls along the area. Uh, for whatever reason, creosote seems to be a plant that is really popular with these gall forming insects. We can actually see at least two different types of galls just on this individual plant. And if you look carefully, we could probably find more. There are probably a dozen species or more, some maybe not even described to science of gall laying insects that can be found on creosote bush. Part of being a naturalist is wanting to understand more about the things that you see down the trail. And you're always discovering more things and learning new things as you go. So you start out by say, learning the name of the bush, the creosote bush, and you start to see a lot of creosote bushes and you kind of get a feeling for what a norm normal creosote bush looks like. And then that helps you notice the differences. So Elizabeth noticed this creosote bush uh, right on the side of the trail that looks a little bit greener than the average creosote bush. And so she came over to look uh, a little closer and see what the difference might be and discover something really amazing going on here. What we think might be really amazing, we're not sure. What we can see is that the stems of the creosote bush are covered in these little red bumps. And moving among those bumps are ants and what appear to be many smaller insects or possibly arachnids. So what's going on here? Well, I can say this is unlike anything I've ever seen before. I don't know exactly what's going on here. So when you see something new like this on the trail, you're not sure what it is. How can you go about trying to figure out what it might be? The, the first step is to make the observation in the first place. So take a second and look closely and you'll see there's the red bumps, there's the ants, there's the other insects, there's the changes in the leaves that look a little different. So ideally we're gonna try and get pictures of all these things and document it really well. Anything you can see that might be out of the ordinary. And if you think there might be a measurement difference, you might carry like a little ruler with you and take a picture of that so you can get scale and all these kinds of things. And then you're going to take these observations and bring them to a place where you think you might be able to find somebody who knows more about it. You can start by uploading your uh, observation to iNaturalist on your phone with a free app and see if it's able to be identified there. Or you may call up your local university, in this case, University of California, Riverside, Palm Desert Campus, and see whether they might be able to point you in the right direction. The important thing to make these kinds of discoveries is to be observant when you're going down the trail and take your time and keep your eye out for these little interesting things that are different from what you might normally expect to find. 
The Indio Hills Badlands Trail is what we call a lollipop loop trail, where you hike out about a mile along a straight path, and then you get to a Y where you can either go left or right, do a loop trail and come back to the same place and then take the original mile trip back. So we started off going clockwise to the left. Almost as soon as you start on the loop part of the trail, you'll start to get into the canyons and start to see some of the geology in the trail. Now, we're seeing these really dramatic landscapes and geology. And the interesting thing is that almost none of this is actually rock. This is what we would call conglomerate. And uh, what has happened is that sometime in the distant past, a flood event has deposited lots of sand and rocks and pebbles and sometimes boulders in a flat plain out here uh, in the middle of the desert. And it happened many times. You had a flood and then some dry period in between and then another flood came and dropped another big amount of sand and rock and then you had a dry period and so on and so forth. And you can see that in the layers here. So you can see like here's a big bunch of sand in layers running this way. And then here's a kind of a rocky layer here with some uh, pebbles and rocks and some bigger rocks in here and then some more sand and then pebbles and rocks down here. So you can imagine these layers of sand and rock getting deposited over time and sort of pushing down the layers on the bottom and compressing them together. And if you let that process go on long enough, you would get sandstone. But in this case, it didn't happen long enough. It only happened for maybe only maybe a few thousand years, uh, tens of thousands of years at the most, probably. Instead of turning into sandstone and being pushed further and further down into the ground, it started to be pushed up, up and up towards the surface. And it started to tilt as it was pushed towards the surface. So you can see these were uh, layers that were laid down horizontally. And over time, they've now turned up to a, a good angle here. And that's caused by the action of the San Andreas Fault, which is right underneath our feet right now. It's not like a big crack in the middle of the trail, but you can see the evidence in the layers tilting around it. As you go through the trail, you get into this narrow part of the canyon, where it's what we call a slot canyon, where the walls are just like shoulder width apart. And the, uh, the hills start to look like Swiss cheese. They have these holes going through them, tunnels in some cases, and arches. And these are formed by, believe it or not, in the desert water. So what's happened here is, again, we're looking at conglomerate making up the construction of the hills. If you run your fingers over it, the sand just kind of erodes away. And among the conglomerate, you'll find sometimes larger rocks. So here's a fist size rock here, and you'll see some rocks that are even larger, can be um, quite large in a, in a big flood. So what happened here, there was a big rock, or maybe several big rocks, in this part of the conglomerate. And whenever there was a new flash flood that came through, once this was uplifted and exposed, it would start to erode around the larger rock and eat into the soft conglomerate and leave that big hard rock uh, there until it had eroded all completely around it and the big rock just fell out of the hillside here leaving this hole behind it where now a new erosion is able to come down into the tunnel and continue on down the canyon we're close to the halfway point of the trail and we're in a wide section of wash here where you can see there's smoke trees and sandier soil and it gives us enough room to really see the geology around us. And the, the landscape almost looks like tortured and bent and warped into these amazing waves and vertical slopes and horizontal slopes, diagonal slopes. You can just imagine the action of the San Andreas Fault underneath our feet, distorting these rocks into these really amazing shapes. To me, it's a really eye-opening way to think about geologic time. We're seeing these rocks on kind of a, a snapshot of their existence where they've been moving, in this case, probably pretty rapidly over tens of thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands of years and changing into these shapes. And they're connected to forces like the San Andreas Fault that have been changing the landscape for millions, if not hundreds of millions of years. And to just think about 
All of the changes that have happened over all those years is an eye-opening way to think about the things that you're seeing on the trail. All right, we've reached the high point of the trail here on the Indio Badlands Trail, and we're at about 530, 540 feet, about 130 meters above sea level. And we've got a really fantastic panoramic view of not just the trail, but the Coachella Valley. And we can really kind of put a lot of the things we've seen along the trail today in context. Not only can you see the folded landscape right along the fault of the Indio Hills here, you can also see Mount San Jacinto in the distance and Mount San Gregorio in the far distance. And between them, the San Gregorio Pass, which is the extension of the San Andreas Fault and where it splits the North American plate on the right from the Pacific plate on the left. And where that spine of mountain ranges that goes up and down California is broken. So these two mountains and the ranges that connect them are part of the rain shadow effect that creates the desert that we're standing in now and creates this dry and relatively brown or less green area to the east of the mountains where moist air coming from the coast hits those mountains in the distance there, pushes up and raises, cools off, drops all the moisture on the far side of the mountains. And then as the air comes over the top here, there's no moisture left and we're left with this, bit, this very dry place where all the plants and animals that we've seen have adapted to this uh, extreme environment. So even though we get very little rain, probably an inch or two a year at this location on average, you can still see the impact that the rain that we do get has on the landscape and the erosion that it causes on the hillsides. Thank you for joining us on our adventure through the Indio Hills Badlands. And it's all downhill from here, so we'll see you on the trail. <laughs>